magandang araw po sa lahat ng ating televiewers sa ating programang VNCCA Hour. Sa loob po na isang oras, inyong matutunghayan ang programang mag-aangat na inyong kaalaman sa ating kultura at sining na may pinamagatang Philippine Santinia. Ang programang ito ay pinangungunahan ng Pambansang Komisyon ng Kultura at Sining na pinamumunuan ni Prof. Felipe De Leon bilang chairman at ni Ginang Emilita V. Almosara bilang executive director. Sa pakikipag-ugnayan sa Federation of International Cable TV Association of the Philippines na pinamumunuan ni Ginang Estrelita J. Tamano at ng istasyong ito. Ang programang pong ito ay may sampung episode na naglalahad ng dokumentaryo tungkol sa ating mayamang kultura at singing na itinahin papawid araw-araw sa lahat ng cable TV stations sa buong bansa. Ako po ang inyong host, Chat Ansagay. After the Philippines gained its independence in 1898, it experienced growth and development in the various fields, including culture and arts, in a span of 100 years. The chronicling of this important milestone of the country's existence as an independent nation-state plays a very critical role in inscribing to our consciousness and understanding of what the Filipinos have done so far in order to achieve independence and nationalism and thereby enrich our cultural and historical heritage. Taong isang libo, siyam na raan, siyam na putwalo. Ipagdiriwang natin ang santa ang taong kalayaan. Ngayon pa lang, sariwain na natin ang kahulugan nito sa mga titik ng ating pambansang awit. Tayo po ay magsitayo, ilagay ang kanang kamay sa dibdib, at awitin natin sabay-sabay ang pambansang awit. The spirit of the Filipino race was shaped by our long history of epic struggle to end oppression and to be free. Many words have been written of this spirit, but it has been embodied in one word, freedom. 1998 commemorates 100 years of the Declaration of Philippine Independence. The vision of President Fidel V. Ramos of rekindling the Filipino spirit of 1898 gave birth to the Philippine Centennial Commission. 1994, the stage was set, the Centennial was organized, and information materials were developed. The Centennial logo was designed, and a five-year master plan approved by the President. 1995 saw the launching of the Philippine Centennial Movement, 
and projects for awareness which includes exhibits, workshops, seminars, and conferences, and a flag and anthem awareness campaign. The Centennial Freedom Trail was initiated, a program dedicated to the restoration, enhancement, and maintenance of 14 national shrines to highlight the revolution. Also at this time, the master plan for the Philippine Centennial Exposition, which is the flagship project of the celebration, was completed. All plans and programs were in preparation for the first thematic year, 1996, the Year of Filipino Heroes. 1996 was centered on the idea of honoring all Filipino heroes. Special recognition was given to our national hero. The Rizal Martyrdom Centennial highlighted his martyrdom by reenacting his execution, which was the major event of 1996. A replica of the Rizal Monument in Luneta was unveiled in the heart of Madrid, Spain. The NCC held several national historical conferences, which served as a prelude to the first ever international conference on the Filipino Revolution and beyond, which was attended by an unprecedented number of international scholars and historians. We also observed the centennials of Marcelo H. Del Pilar, Graciano Lopez Aina, Pugad Lawin, Pinaglabanan, Battle of Pinacayan, Trece Martires of Cavite, the period of May 28 to June 12 was declared as Flag Day and saw the first dramatic and massive nationwide display of the Filipino flag ever. President Ramos called on all government officials to join the Philippine Centennial Movement, which flourished not only nationally, but also in several other countries. The rekindling of the Filipino spirit which is the objective of the centennial celebration is now happening, as shown by surveys conducted by the social weather station. More than 50% of the Filipino population is aware of the centennial celebrations. 81% are now proud again to be Filipinos because of their history. And 9 out of 10 respondents feel that the centennial is indeed an important event to them individually. The stage is set. Filipinos are raring to go through the Centennial Freedom Trail. Celebrate the Centennial. Participate in the Expo in Clark. And look forward to the collective rekindling of the Filipino spirit on June 12, 1998. ago, in the heart of Asia, a new nation declared its freedom. A nation forged in the fire of revolution. Inspired by its love of peace, justice, and democracy, this new republic was the Philippines. In the century that would follow the revolution of 1896, the Filipino people would face many trials. In war, in peace, in the many daily challenges that confront a modern nation. But they would always prevail, having proved themselves worthy of any adversary. Today, the Filipino people look back with pride and joy on a century of independence. And look forward with hope to another century of dynamic growth and change. When the Spaniards arrived in 1521, they found a flourishing native culture, known to its Asian neighbors, busy with trading activity. The Spanish were welcomed as friends by the native inhabitants, 
But the Spanish had a different agenda. The Spanish sword and the Catholic cross would soon prevail over the archipelago and its people. While Spanish rule would bring some lasting influences in the art, culture, and language of the Filipinos, it would also bring great hardship for the masses, who would bear the heavy burdens of a colonized race. Tributes, an endless stream of permits to procure, monopolies, forced labor without compensation, corruption and brutality, courtesy of the Guardia Civil, and the excesses of some Spanish authorities and friars who took advantage of their positions for private gain. Even for a people as forbearing as the Filipinos, there would be a limit to suffering in silence. Native workers and soldiers mutinied at the arsenal in Cavite to protest the unjust taxation of their salaries. The mutiny was savagely suppressed by the governor general, but its consequences spread. The Cavite mutiny was used as an excuse by the authorities to move against native priests. After a mock trial, three secular Filipino priests, Mariano Gomez, Jose Burgos, and Jacinto Zamora, Gomburza, were executed by Garot. The Garot execution of the Gomburza would fan the flames of reform, and later, of revolution. The death of the Gomburza would leave an indelible mark on the Filipinos of the time, planting the embers of reform in the hearts of many. Some of the brightest of those flames would burn abroad. In Europe, where the sons of the Filipino upper class, the Ilustrados, had gone to study and to know the world. The propaganda movement launched by these young men would do much to expose the ills of colonial Philippine society even if it meant hardship or death to some of them. Jose Rizal, Graciano Lopez Jaina, Marcelo del Pilar, Mariano Ponce, Jose Maria Pananiban were some ilustrados whose names would become synonymous with the quest for freedom. Jose Rizal, doctor, writer, artist, but above all, a patriot, returned to the Philippines and founded La Liga Filipina, a patriotic society dedicated to the spread of the ideas of reform. Noli Metangere and El Filibusterismo, two of the greatest novels in Philippine history, were written by Jose Rizal to open the minds of people to the abuses of the Spanish authorities in the Philippines and spread the idea of change. Rizal was tried by a Spanish court. He was found guilty of sedition and executed by firing squad at 7.03 a.m. at Magumbayan, Manila. Rizal's death would further stir the flames of revolution. Andres Bonifacio, a man of the people, a champion of freedom. Through hard work and patient study, Bonifacio freed himself from the clutches of poverty to become one of the greatest leaders of the revolution. Inspired by Rizal's writings, Bonifacio organized a secret society dedicated to achieving nothing less than independence. This society would be known as the Kataas-taasang Kagalang-galangan Katipunan ng mga anak ng bayan. The highest and most respectable society of the sons of the people, or more simply, the Katipunan. The members signed their names in blood as a symbol of their commitment to the struggle for freedom. Secretly, the Katipuneros passed on the message of freedom in print and by word of mouth. From 300 members, the Katipunan's ranks rose in number to 30,000 on the eve of the revolution. In defiance of Spanish authority at Pugadlawin on the outskirts of Manila, 
the Katipuneros, revolutionaries all, publicly tore up their poll tax receipts. The cry spread out. Mabuhay ang Katipunan. Mabuhay ang Kalayaan. Long live the Katipunan. Long live freedom. The fires of revolution broke out into an open conflagration. One town followed another in joining the cause of the Katipuna. San Juan del Mundo, San Francisco de Malabon, Cauca, Noveleta, San Isidro, Pimes. Places engraved today on the map of Philippine history. All around Manila, from late August to November, the revolutionaries gave battle and scored early victories. Severely undermanned, the Spaniards sent for reinforcements. Governor General Ramon Blanco, thought to be too lenient, was replaced by Governor General Camilo de Polavieja, an iron-fisted warrior. To weaken the Filipino spirit, Polavieja imposed a virtual reign of terror, arresting and executing hundreds of Filipinos. For the moment, the Spaniards regained the upper hand, Confident of their superiority in arms, the Spaniards launched an offensive into Cavite, stronghold of the Katipuneros. At Pinacayan in Cavite, the Spanish offensive was slowed down by the trenches of the revolutionaries. These trenches were built on the orders of General Emilio Aguinaldo, the young mayor of the town of Cau. The Battle of Pinacayan was hard fought. But the Spanish were outflanked by Aguinaldo, and victory was secured. Emilio Aguinaldo, educated and already a leader before the start of the uprising, would rise to the leadership of the revolution beside Andres Bonifacio. Supporters of Aguinaldo led a movement to organize a new government to replace the Katipuna. A convention was held at Tejeros to establish this, and Aguinaldo was declared president. The Spanish, too, were busy changing leaders. Primo de Rivera replaced Camilo de Polavieja as governor general. De Rivera mounted a fresh offensive against Aguinaldo's forces and captured Cavite. Drawing in the face of far superior firepower, Aguinaldo consolidated his forces in the mountain stronghold of Piac Nabato. There, the revolutionaries set up a republican government, the Piac Nabato Republic, founded on a democratic constitution. Weary of war, the Spaniards negotiated a truce with Aguinaldo. As part of the agreement, Aguinaldo and his lieutenants left for temporary exile in Hong Kong. The United States had entered the war against Spain. Aguinaldo, with American help, returned to the Philippines and resumed the struggle for independence from Spain. The Filipino revolutionaries launched a strong offensive against the remaining Spanish forces in the Philippines. And by June, practically all of Luzon had been captured. The other islands in the archipelago were soon to follow, with Filipino forces spreading out, fueled by the fires of revolution. On June 12, 1898, one of Philippine history's most glorious days, Emilio Aguinaldo proclaimed the independence of the Philippines in Cauit, Cavite. Ninety-eight persons signed the Declaration of Independence. The Philippine flag, sewn earlier in Hong Kong by Mrs. Marcela Agoncillo, was flown officially for the first time, and Filipinos also heard what would become their new national anthem. The government proclaimed that Kawit had been a dictatorial government, but at the insistence of Apolinario Mabini, Aguinaldo's chief advisor, it was later changed to a revolutionary government with a Congress representing the people for advisory purposes. On September 15, 1898, 
the Revolutionary Congress met at the Baraswain Basilica in the town of Malolos in Bulacan province. The Congress drafted a new constitution creating a Filipino state with a popular representative and responsible government with distinct executive, legislative, and judicial branches. By just one vote, the Malolos Congress also decided for the separation of church and state. A powerful lawmaking assembly emerged to be composed of legally elected delegates. On January 23, 1899, the first Philippine Republic was inaugurated in Malolos with Emilio Aguinaldo as president. The 1896 revolution was over and a new century dawned on the horizon, fraught with challenge and opportunity. The Filipino people would later have to fight again, but they would do so under their own flag, in defense of their hard-won freedom, for peace, justice, and progress for all Filipinos, all over the archipelago, from one generation to the next. As we start not only on the threshold of the 21st century, and all the challenges and opportunities that that portends. But also we are on the threshold of unprecedented prosperity and progress. And if we keep on this path of economic reform and liberalization, the Philippines will emerge to claim its destiny as one of Asia's most capable economic performers. <laughs>